Disorders of sexual development have often been considered as a medical and a social emergency. But what's been often ignored that it is actually an emergency for the doctors who rush towards going to the books with the various things as to how to evaluate an individual with DSD. IDSD will focus on the entire aspects of the sorosexual sexual differentiation ranging from pathophysiology to classification to evaluation and management to website learning.growsociety.in from which we are webcasting this event where we have got multiple options available for learning in the form of our master pediatric endocrine course over 18 months covering nearly now 100 modules on everything related to pediatric endocrinology. So if you want to learn, you've got each and every aspect which is there using videos, using text, pre-test, case scenarios, and everything available. We have recently launched a pediatric endocrinology for postgraduate program, which again is covering a number of learning modules, specifically for postgraduates for a three-year period. All of you can have a look at a book which is available. And along with that, there we have the mobile application basically, which is covering in that perspective, the various aspects of management of pediatric endocrine disorders including the approach pathway, the management pathway, the personalized management care, and there are various ways you can use. It's a very intuitive form in terms of evaluating patients with different disorders of pediatric endocrinology. And these are available on Android and iOS. So without wasting much time, we'll discuss about the fundamentals of sexual development. Now, what we need to understand is <clears throat> that all of us start from a unicellular stage. And from that unicellular stage, basically everything is gender non-dimorphic. So a single cell, of course, has no difference between male and female. From there, there is so much differentiation which happens in terms of the sexual development. And this involves multiple steps. The first step is genetics, which determines the initial phase. Then we have the development of the gonads, testis or ovary. Then we have got production of the hormones, testosterone and estrogen which then act on their receptors and then finally cause differentiation and finally development of gender identity. So the whole process of sexual development starts from genetics to gonadal development, hormonal production, hormonal action, and then gender identity. And each and every step can be defective in that regards. <clears throat> so we'll start off with the gonadal development. So what we know is that all the gonads, the adrenals and the kidneys develop from the urogenital ridge, which basically emerges by around four to six weeks of life. And from that, we have the gonad, the bipotential gonad, which can produce both ovary and testis develops and multiple enzymes pathways are responsible for that. There are CBX2, GATA4, which are important, but most important are NR5A1, and which are also involved in adrenal involvement and WT1, which are involved in terms of the renal involvement. So the initial gonadal development depends upon a number of genes which also regulate the adrenal growth and the renal growth. So whenever you're looking at an individual who comes to you with an atypical genitalia, always consider the possibility of a problem in the adrenals and the kidneys, and that's a very, very important thing. The first case was a classical example of XYDSD who developed renal failure because of a WT1 defect. Now, once the gonad is developed, this bipotential gonad is exactly same with regards to both boys and girls, both for testis and ovary. And then these genes will interact further to make it mature. So NR5A1 and WT1 both are essential for both primordial testis and primordial ovarian development. But when we say they are more likely to be associated with XYDSD and not XXDSD is a very, very simple fact to remember. XXDSD has to be an act of commission. You need to have some extra way in which androgen is coming, androgen is working more, while X, Y, D, S, D will come basically when you have got an act of omission in that you have, you don't have the enough production of this in that regard. So there's a difference there. So if there is a gene defect, that will basically cause X, Y, D, S, D, but not X, X, D, S, D in that situation. So these two will then develop the gonad. And from there, you have got the first factor, the S, R, Y gene which is there in the Y chromosome, which determines the development of testis. 
and this SRY gene along with NR5A1 will activate the major protestors gene, which is the SOX9. So basically the interaction of SRY and NRA5A1 is essential for SOX9. And this SOX9 controls the entire testicular development, right? From the Sertoli cells to the Leydig cells to the myoid cells. So all the testis is controlled via SOX9 in that situation, along with the role of FGF9. Now, if you do not have this SRY, the anti-testis or the pro-ovary genes will start to become interact in that cell perspective, and that will have a role in that regards. So basically, what happens is that there are anti-testis genes like DAX1 and FOXL2, which basically are responsible for ovarian development. And there is always a tussle going around in terms of the testicular gene and the ovarian gene, and this will result in ovarian development. Now, FOXL2 and SOX9 are the major determinants of whether that particular bipotential gonad will develop into a testis or a ovary. Conditions which are associated with greater amount of SOX9 expression even in a XX individual will result in testicular development. Higher FOXL2 and higher DAX1, duplication of DAX1 will basically present more in terms of our development of the ovaries rather than testis in that perspective. So now if you look at the overall process of the development, we'll go by male and female. So for male, we need to have the XY, then the testicular development, testosterone production, testosterone action, differentiation, and finally gender identity. And the whole process is linked with each other. So when we talk about testis, it is made up of number of cellular pathways, which basically include the germ cell, which is a big part of the testis. These germ cells basically are not produced in the testis. They actually come from the coelomic epithelium around five to six weeks, and then they migrate from there to go into the testis around seven to eight weeks. Then we have got the Sertoli cells which start appearing by seven to nine weeks, which are the major determinant of a number of testicular functions, particularly the production of the anterior anti-mullerian hormone, which causes regression of the mullerian structure and inhibin B. We have got the myoid cells, which are more like a supportive cell for testis around eight to 10 weeks. And finally, the Leydig cells, which appear by 10 to 11 weeks, which produce testosterone, which causes development of the external genitalia, as well as the INSL3 or insulin-like factor three, which causes testicular descent. So in a way, if you talk about sexual development, Sertoli cells and Leydig cells are important. If there are defects in the Sertoli cells, there will be no AMH. There will be a mullerian structure, which is there. If there is a Leydig cell problem, there will be difficulties in terms of development of external genitalia because testosterone is not there, or there will be issues of testicular descent, which requires INSL3. Now, if we just talk about the testicular descent, and this is particularly important from an XY DSD perspective, is that to, for testis to descend, there are two parts which happen. The first part is the abdominal phase, and that is largely regulated by probably a number of factors, including INSN3. This is intrinsic to the testis. From the inguinal, the abdominal phase to the inguinal phase, it is largely androgen dependent. So if there are problems in androgen synthesis or in terms of action, the testis will basically be inguinal. So if you have inguinal testis, it basically means that the testis is reasonably all right. It is able to produce maybe AMH and ISL3. The problem is mainly in terms of steroidogenesis, which basically, as then Pratik will talk about, the risk of malignancy becomes substantially lower in that situation. On the other hand, if the testis is abdominal, it basically means that it is grossly dysgenetic. It is not even capable to descend from the abdomen, and which basically means that there is a high risk of developing a number of these complications, particularly malignancies, which will be likely in that setting. Very important to remember is how these hormones and these accesses play off. Now, what we see clearly is that the LH will start appearing by around 12 weeks of life because this is when the pituitary is going to get matured. The FSH will start peaking a bit later. 
But what we need to remember is that testosterone peaks much earlier. And this 8 to 12 weeks of gestation is absolutely vital for the testosterone action. Because this is the time when you will need to have the labioscrotal fusion. If there is testosterone deficiency during this period, you will have hypospadia, the atypical genitalia. Testosterone deficiency beyond that period will basically result in micropenis, but not hypospadia. And what you're seeing out here is that this LH is not playing any role here. So what's controlling this testosterone? It's actually the HCG, which is coming from the placenta. So even if you have got no pituitary, no hypothalamus, no LH, you will still have a normal fusion because placental HCG will take care of this eight to 12 weeks. There would be micropenis which will develop, but not Undescended, not undescended testis or not classically in the sense of hypospadia. So if you talk about hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, Kalaman syndrome, you would not have these problems which are happening in this situation. And this is extremely important from that perspective. Now, a word about testicular serogenesis because that's important from a clinical perspective for XYDSD. The 7-DHC, which is the primary compound from which you have produced cholesterol using DHC, is the most important part. And from there, you will have this cholesterol, which is converted via a number of enzymes, cyclin cleavage, star, and 3-beta-HSD into progesterone. From there, you have got the testicular development. Many of these steroidogenic pathways are shared by the adrenals as well as the testis. So defects in them will cause a salt-wasting form of CAH along with our XYDSD. Now, this progesterone is converted via 17 hydroxylase into androstenedione, dione, from there via 17 beta HSG to testosterone. Testosterone is basically a pro hormone. It has got an affinity for the androgen receptor, but the affinity is much higher for the dihydrotestosterone. And this is very, very important in the perspective of 5 alpha reductase deficiency. Now, what we need to understand is that you need to have much higher level of testosterone to have the same effect as that of a dihydrotestosterone. So in tissues which are very close to the testis, you will have a hugely high level of testosterone, like let's say the seminal vesicle, the internal structure, the Wolfian duct, and therefore in 5-alpha reductase deficiency, where you're not producing dihydrotestosterone, there will be no problem in internal genitalia. While if we talk about penile growth, that is determined based upon systemic levels. And the systemic levels of testosterone will not be high. So therefore, 5-alpha reductase deficiency will predominantly present to you with external genitalia issues. And during puberty, once your androgen levels really go up, they will be able to act on the androgen receptor. And that will result in some virilization. So 5-alpha reductase is classically known as penis at nine syndrome. And this basically is a situation wherein you will be born, the individual will be born basically with atypical genitalia, which will then virilize during puberty. And therefore, it would be imprudent to label them or raise them as a female. Because you would expect that they would have had a good amount of exposure of androgens in the fetal period, as well as during the mini puberty. So the programming of the centers which regulate gender identity will already have been happened. And during puberty, again, you will have an increased production and that will again regulate in that perspective. And therefore, this 5-alpha reductase deficiency should always be reared as a male in that perspective. If on the other hand, you talk about androgen insensitivity, that will basically have no virilization at puberty because the androgens are increasing, but they will not act. In fact, they will feminize during puberty because this androgen will be converted into estrogen and that will cause more growth in that perspective. So defect anywhere at the DHC, which cause smith lemily opitz syndrome, these milder forms or the severe form of CA, the side chain cleavage star, 17 hydroxylase associated with hypertension, 17 beta HSD complete reversal, and 5 alpha reductase will all cause XYDSD. And this is what will be discussed by Riddhi after this part.
in that regards. Now, DHT, as discussed, acts upon the uh, androgen receptor, and then testosterone is aromatized to estradiol in that situation. As I discussed, testosterone will be converted via 5-alpha reductase into DHT, which then can cross into the cell and act on the androgen receptor from where it goes into the nucleus. So it's basically an intracellular receptor, which then acts on the nucleus like a transcription factor and regulates the production of different proteins. Now this testosterone can also act on this receptor, but its potency is much lower. And that's why in 5-alpha reductase, you will have a lower production in the beginning. You will have lesser testosterone and more genital abnormalities as puberty happens, the levels will soar and you will have an increased production in that situation. Now, in terms of the internal genitalia development, as discussed, they are all the same. So they are basically the Mullerian duct and the Wolfian duct. So if we talk about the development from the testes at seven weeks, AMH will basically cause a regression of the Mullerian structure. And then you have eight weeks, you've got testosterone coming up, which is causing stabilization of the Wolfian structure. And this Wolfian structure will then result in development of the epididymis, vas difference, and seminal vesicle. So the defects in testosterone production before 12 weeks of life will have a huge implication on both internal and external genitalia. Beyond 12 weeks, the only problem which will happen is in the setting of having a small phallic size or micropenis with a normal genitalia in that regard. So on that, what is happening is that this Mullerian structure is basically gone. Now we have got this Wolfian duct which develops into the epididymis, vast difference in the seminal vesicle, which progresses from there. Just a word about the female sexual development. It's often been said that the female development is more like a passive process, but it's not true. There are a lot of active genes which are also involved, and that's why we have got autosomal problems which also cause DST. Yes, what you need to understand is that if you have an act of omission, the default development mode, so to speak, is a female. So if you have got a SRY gene deletion, if you have got a complete steratogenic defect, if you have got a complete androgen insensitivity, the XY individual will develop into a female. Problems in ovarian development estrogen production, estrogen action, they will all present with delayed puberty and primary amenorrhea. They will not present with DSD. So for a XX DSD to happen, you need to have an active process, which is there. Again, the female development involves the genetics, the gonads, the hormones, the receptor, differentiation, and finally, the gender identity. In terms of the hormonal development, if you look at it, what we see is that the levels are much higher in girls. So LH and FSH levels are very, very high, particularly around the preterm gestations, and they tend to be persistently high in that regards. What you need to understand here is that if you have got a preterm baby and you look at the levels at around 26, 28 weeks of gestation, the LH, FSH levels will be looking like menopausal. So you have to be cautious in evaluating these individuals. And one condition which is extremely common in that regards is the atypical uh, clitoromegaly, which happens in the preterm newborn, which is more like a swelling rather than really a clitoromegaly. In that setting, if you do LHFSA, the levels may be falsely high and that will cause confusion in that regards. And estrogen levels are of no relevance because the first antral follicle starts to develop just at term and you will have some amount of estrogen at birth. So even if there is zero estrogen, there will be no disorder of sexual development in an XX individual in that regard. Now, ovarian steatogenesis, the pathways are similar. So the same, we're talking about cholesterol, and from cholesterol, you've got this production of progesterone, which, as discussed in ovary, is by the theca cell produced into androstenedione, and then by granulosa cell into aromatase. So the same processes are involved in that regard. Defects in the synthesis pathway will not cause DSD. This is what I'm trying time and again. Unless you have androgen excess, you will not have a XX DSD. Of course, if there is a problem of uh, aromatase, if the problem of 21 hydroxylase or POR, you will have more androgens and that is going to cause a DSD in that 
situation. So this is how it works. And in terms of development, again, because there is no testosterone, the Wolfian structure will not be supported and Mullerian duct will basically develop under these influences and you will have other influences like WNT4. What's very important to remember is that Mullerian duct is responsible for the development of the fallopian tube, uterus, and upper third of vagina. So conditions associated with Mullerian agenesis or even complete antigen insensitivity may have a small vagina because the lower vagina is not dependent upon this whole Mullerian structures. So even if your AMH is there, AMH is working, you may have a blind vagina, which may be there in that regards. And this Mullerian structures are absolutely important to identify because they will very easily help you classify the DSD into two into two. You look at basically gonads plus minus, Mullerian structures plus minus, and there are four big classifications coming up guiding how to investigate. Now, how do you look for these Mullerian structures? You can do a parectal examination using your little finger and feel for a resistance or an ultrasound. Now, what you need to understand is that the uterus is big at birth in girls because of the maternal estrogen exposure. So if you are not seeing a uterus, it usually means that it's actually an absent uterus and it's not easy to miss it, so to speak, in that situation. Now, external genital air development definitely of course, involves mainly estrogenic exposure. If, however, there is more androgens, which they will cause more growth and clitoromegaly in that perspective. As for boys, there is no labioscrotal fusion after 12 weeks. So if you have a newborn who presented to you with Prada 3, Prada 4, with a labioscrotal fusion, you are dealing with basically an antenatal excess of androgens, if it's happening after 12 weeks, it will only cause clitoromegaly. And that's an important point to remember, just as we were talking about how androgen deficiency before 12 weeks causes a typical genitalia, beyond 12 weeks will basically cause a normal genitalia with micropenis in that situation. The second major organ after the gonads in the entire axis is of course the adrenals because this is an important source of androgens and adrenals basically convert cholesterol, same pathway to progesterone. And from there, there are three different pathways. The 11 hydroxylase will take it towards the aldosterone, 21 will take it towards cortisol and 17 will take it towards DHEAS. So if there's a deficiency of, of any of these, if cortisol is less, you will have increased ACTH production and accumulation of all these compounds before the block. And that is going to cause a lot of problems and confusion in that perspective. So these are the reasons which we know as congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the most common cause of XXDSD. Again, this is an act of commission in which you have got more androgens coming up. It is not an act of omission, true to speak, in that perspective. And this is how it progresses. And of course, a very important enzyme here is the POR, the oxidoreductase, which basically controls the three major enzymes, the 21, the 17, and aromatase. And POR deficiency will also cause a XXDSD in that situation, in that perspective. So problems in 3-beta-HSD, they will cause salt wasting and DSD. Problems in 21-hydroxylase will cause uh, salt wasting and DSD. 11 will cause hypertensive variant with DSD. Aromatase deficiency will cause normal salt status with DSD. And POR will cause salt wasting in DSD. So again, looking at the sodium status and looking at the DSD pattern, you will know which way to go forward in that regards. A couple of words with regards to the placenta. Placenta is a very, very important organ. It not only acts like a sieve of preventing the androgen exposure, it also is an active endocrine organ. So basically, the androgen and estrogen cannot cross the placenta because you've got 17 beta HSD. So generally, maternal virilization will not cause fetal virilization unless the dose is huge. So if there is too much androgens, you're giving some medication which is causing that. Otherwise, the placenta is able to take care of it in that perspective. The other thing to remember is that this DHEAS, which is being produced in industrial amounts by the adrenal, cannot cross because this aromatase 
converts it into estriol. If there is aromatase deficiency, you will have more androgens and that will cause the problem. Very importantly, we have still now talked more in terms of biological factors. There is also an identity issue. We need to understand what really is gender identity. So gender identity, gender role, and sexual orientation are three different things. Gender identity is what that particular individual identifies with. And this is the most important thing because role will depend upon what society you are in. And orientation is, of course, a much more wider term in that perspective. The major determinant of gender identity is actually the androgen. So if there is a fetal androgen exposure, like Prada 5 CH, 21 hydroxylase, they would have a gender identity issue. And it is usually determined by eight to 12 weeks of gestation. So that period is very, very crucial in that situation. So now once you've discussed everything, I'll just summarize to form the basis of other speakers to come in and chip in. So we've got the urogenital ridge from which we develop the gonads. And WT1 is also regulating the development of the kidneys. NR5A1 is developing the adrenals. Now, which produces DHEAs, which is causing the androgen exposure. We have got the testis, which is regulated via SRY and SOX9, and it is regulated via the LHCG receptor, in which the LH and HCG are both acting in that situation, which induce the Leydig cell producing testosterone and which is converted by the 5-alpha reductase into DHT, which acts on the androgen receptor. We also will have the FSH angle acting by the FSH receptor on the Sertoli cells to produce AMH, which causes regression of the Mullerian structure. So both of these axes have a important issue, and we can understand that in that perspective. So if there is Mullerian structure which is present, it means that there is a total testicular failure. From the ovarian side, if there is a DAX1 FOXL2, that will produce the ovaries. And from there, there will be the theca cell production via the LH action. And FSH will induce aromatase to produce estradiol, which will act on the estrogen receptor to cause increased uterine growth in that perspective. So this is the overall pathophysiological pathway. And if you have defects anywhere, you can have a problem in that regards. So problems can be at the level of gonadal development. There could be a problem in WT1, which causes X6DST, NR5A1, again XYDST, problems in SRY, XYDST, problems in SOX9, XYDST, problems in DAX1. So again, duplication of DAX1 will cause a testicular regression, again, a XYDST, or you can have increased androgen production causing 21 hydroxyl deficiency, causing a X6DST in that regard. There could be problems in the ovarian axis. And what we need to remember is that it should not cause DST unless there is a problem in the aromatase in which you've got more androgens, which is causing DST with maternal virilization. And finally, this is a large chunk. There could be a problem in the development of the testis, hormone formation and action. So this could be a LHCG receptor defect, 5-alpha reductase defect, AMH defect, or the androgen insensitivity, and they will all cause uh, XYDSD in that regards, and that will be important. So if you now classify DSD, it could be XX, in which there will be Mullerian structure, but no gonads. The conditions basically will include androgen excess, like 21, most likely, 3 beta HSD, POR, aromatase, luteoma of pregnancy, and ovarian tumor, very, very rare. Dysgenesis, in which you've got SRY insertion, which may happen, or SOX9 activation, and rarely RSPO1 and FOXL2. XYDSD, in which there will be a testis, but there will be no Mullerian structure in that setting. This includes dysgenesis like NRA51, WT1, SRY, DAX1, inefficient testosterone effect in the form of a LHCG receptor defect, ceratogenic defects, 3 beta HSD, 17 hydroxylase, and 3 beta, 17 beta HSD. 5-alpha reductase and AIS, and finally, sex chromosome DST, in which you can have a testicular DST or you can have a over-testicular DST in which you've got both ovaries and testis. This may represent a problem of mosaicism or chimerism. <music>